Hello everyone and welcome back to my first video in the OWASP Top 10 for 2017. In the introduction video we talked a little bit about who OWASP are and what the Top 10 is. So now I have a video for each of the Top 10 with examples where that's possible. And the first one, which was also the first one in 2013, is Injection. And lots of people have heard of SQL injection, but injection can cover other things as well that we'll look at in a bit. And this is still a big issue, which is a shame really, because it's pretty well known. Most people have heard of it. If I ask people for one of the top 10, almost everybody will know that SQL injection is a vulnerability. And because it's so easy to fix or to prevent injection attacks, it's still a shame that it's so prevalent, but I guess there's still this issue of uh, training materials, of books, of, of university and college training, where the materials haven't really caught up. And the danger is you kind of maybe show an example of some code of how to do a SQL query, but because the main point of the example is about the query, People don't feel like they should layer it in a load of kind of security code. So when somebody sees that, they copy, they paste it, and straight away they've created a vulnerability. So this is the kind of the standard grid that you see in each of the top 10 to show how this got its position in the chart. So in terms of injection and the game, we're generally we're talking more about SQL injection. It's certainly much more common than say LDAP injection or file system injection. So I'll probably end up talking about both without really meaning to. But we're talking about something that's very, e um, very easy to exploit. So actually putting SQL injection into a, a text box, which we'll show you in a second, is so easy to do. There's tooling to do it for you to actually automatically discover certain things. And the prevalence, so the, sorry, these are out of uh, scores out of three. So three in this case saying that's, that's the most serious level. Prevalence or how common this thing is, it's only a two. So saying, well, it's not maybe as common as certain other vulnerabilities, but actually since all of the other measures are three, that puts this right at the top of the list. Detectability, because it's easy to detect, that means an attacker can find out that your application is vulnerable very easily, which means then they're going to spend more time uh, or potentially spend more time trying to create a deeper attack, trying to expose more information. And the technical impact of injection Pretty much they can do anything that your application can do. So they can read anything, they can delete anything, so clearly the technical impact is very, very high. And the business impact will depend on your your organization and what the application's doing. But in most cases, we can assume that the business impact is going to be pretty big as well. For some companies, that could be fines by a regulator of millions of dollars, millions of pounds. So it's something that we definitely need to take seriously. So what are we talking about here? Well, really, we're talking about untrusted data. So any data that comes from user input and that user data is then applied to some sort of query or interpreter in a way that assumes what the data will look like. So we assume the user is going to do something in a certain way, but an attacker deliberately does it in a different way in order, obviously, to either cause damage or to get information from your system. So the attacker enters some kind of data that does not fit the expected or the assumed input, but malforms it in some way to have uh, a consequence is unintended for you, but is intended for the attacker. So we're talking about error leakage. We're talking about damage to data. So that's an integrity violation or exposure of data is a confidentiality violation. So really, anything that is possible to do on the web application is up for grabs with a successful injection attack. Now, one thing that's kind of significant that we need to understand is an attacker can bypass any client side controls. So that says that might be intended, that might be intended to stop this. 
So you put in JavaScript validators, for example, that isn't enough because an attacker can bypass anything that is in the browser. And this is particularly significant with the modern idea of front end frameworks, things like Angular and React, where the entire application from a journey point of view lives in the browser. And then there's only an API in the back end. So you've got to be really careful here that the API is not making assumptions about the data coming back from the front end app being correct, because all of that can be bypassed. And as I said before, we're usually talking about SQL injection. LDAP injection is less common, but actually being able to inject operating system calls is not actually unheard of. Somebody puts in something that's supposed to retrieve a file from the, a directory, for example. And if the check isn't made that the file name is a valid file name, then what can happen is somebody can do something like grab the file, pipe it to another command that grabs etc. passwords or something from the file system. And of course, if the application has the permission to, to carry out that operation then you could be leaking all kinds of stuff from the server so how common are we talking about here well as we saw in the grid earlier it's not the most common it's not a three out of three but it is the most serious vulnerability uh, because even though it's not common we're talking here again about detect um, this is exploitability if the site is vulnerable it's very easy to take advantage of and I'll show you how easy in a second uh, it's very detectable and so despite the fact that it's not the most common, this does make it serious. Many frameworks are vulnerable by default. And here we have a bit of a problem for SQL injection. It's a fairly abstract, or for injection generally, it's a fairly abstract kind of problem. So it's very difficult for a framework to prevent this by default. Almost always the way that you fix it is by adding other controls adding different kinds of database access patterns, which may or may not be the normal way to do something in a particular framework. So for example, active, um, uh, active record as a pattern and entity framework as a pattern are both you know, used by default in certain frameworks and they both kind of rely on building SQL commands dynamically. We'll see what that means in a minute. And by doing that, they're vulnerable by default uh, or, or in, you know, even if they're not vulnerable by default, particularly it's very easy for somebody just to dump some code in there and straight away cause the vulnerability. Lots of examples again mentioned before textbooks online, uh, you know, they use code that's vulnerable. And it might be because the author is just not trying to teach security. I mean, I mean, one of the dangers of sites like Stack Overflow, somebody says, how do I query something from a database? Well, the answer is how to query it from a database. The answer should kind of include the security part of it, but that's not what the question was. So unless the author makes it very clear that that, that example is just the, the basic functionality and that security needs to be added on afterwards. And even if they say that, there's no guarantee that somebody who doesn't really know what they're doing isn't just going to copy and paste it. And that's a shame. Books tend to live for a long time. They, Although technology changes, if you buy a textbook, you don't want to throw it away in two months and buy another one. So some of that bad code is going to live around for quite a long time. So let's see what this actually looks like. We're going to go. I've got a, an application here. I've used Visual Studio and .NET Core, not for any particular reason. It's just uh, the one that I'm kind of most familiar with. And I have an application here. It looks quite big and complicated, but this is just the default application that comes out from Visual Studio when you create a new one. So none of these pages are particularly relevant. The only one that's relevant is this um, this tab that I've added here, which is a bank account. And let's assume this is a bank account application. So you're working at a bank and this is the create account page. So somebody comes in and says, I want a new account. So the theory is that you type in a name, like say Luke Briner, you hit create account. That comes back telling you that the account has been created. And in my example, if I look here, you'll see that these are all the, the, current, uh, the current list of accounts from the database. 
This is just a local database. It doesn't really matter. Any kind of SQL database is vulnerable to this kind of attack. I've just used local DB because it just only takes five seconds to, to set up. So you see we've got some accounts there. If I just create uh, a different one just to prove that it's all working correctly, if I go back and refresh that, you'll see now that it's added a you know another name at the bottom. So that's all pretty straightforward. Another thing to notice is there's a message here and in the code all that happens is once the account gets created it sets a message and it displays the message. It doesn't redirect anywhere. So you know that's all fairly straightforward. The difficult uh, difficulty that we have is when we write this code like here we're kind of thinking, right, what are they going to type in? Oh, they're going to type in a name, aren't they? Great. So let's just create a SQL query with that name in it and kind of dump it into the database and we're all happy. What we don't necessarily think or plan for, or what we definitely don't plan for most of the time, is what is an attacker going to do? What are they going to try? And let's kind of take a step back from that initially and say, well, well what happens if somebody just accidentally kind of types something silly in? Now, they might have done it by accident. They might have accidentally pasted a password in or they might just be playing around. You know, what happens? Well, that said account created again. So in this case, if I go back and look at our data again, you see what's actually happened is, well, that's fine. That's accepted it as valid. It's chucked it in the database. This may or may not be a problem. It's obviously wrong in terms of theoretically it's wrong because that is obviously not somebody's name. But it, technically, it's not necessarily wrong. It's not necessarily going to break anything. It's just a bit daft. So that's kind of a, a low level kind of issue that might already prove that we're doing something incorrectly. And even if we weren't testing for security, I would hope that a tester would try something like that and flag that as a defect because clearly that's you know not, not an expected use case. But... Um, that's fine in terms of an accidental kind of mistyping, but how does SQL injection? So we're talking specifically about SQL injection. The general theory is going to apply to all forms of injection, but the specifics here are going to be for SQL. So, uh, you know, I'll explain that as I go along. Now, imagine I come along and I'm actually an attacker rather than somebody actually trying to create a proper bank account. So I come in here and I'm going to assume how this data is actually getting formed. I'm going to assume that it's going to do something like, let's bring up Notepad. I assume the code is going to be something like, you know, insert into, you know, bank account table. And it's probably going to have a name because it's only asking me for a name. So it can't insert much more than that. Now, this might not be exactly correct. But I reckon it's going to do that. It's going to take the name here from the input field and that's what it's going to run. I'm going to assume it's going to do something like that. So that's where I'm going to start my kind of assumption. Now, if that is the case, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to effectively close the query that I think is being built. So actually, that's going to be in single quotes, just to be clear. And that's going to be a name. So let's say I think it's going to normally do something like that. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to close the statement that I think it's going to run. And I'm going to put a semicolon because in SQL that allows you to, to write another statement. And then initially I'm just going to do some kind of garbage. I don't really care. And then importantly, I'm then going to put in a SQL comment. Now, I'll show you what's actually happening here. That's what I expect it to do. And that's because I expect that in here, I'm going to have some kind of placeholder in my string that's going to put the contents of that box. So let's look what happens when I take that box and I paste it in directly. Oh, that's interesting. So I actually have a valid SQL statement. And because I don't have control over that part of the text, the only part I've actually got control over is that. But by a clever use of characters in my text box, I can close that in a normal statement, add my new statement, and then comment out the last parts of the text using a dash dash SQL comment. So now what happens when I run this? Bang! 
And this is a problem for two reasons. The first obvious reason is I have proved that there is some kind of SQL injection vulnerability in this site. Now, that shouldn't have erred. If I'd have written this site properly, if the site wasn't vulnerable to SQL query, I would expect some kind of either a silent error or ideally an error saying, no, you've put in some rubbish data. That's that's not correct. Or, or maybe in, in a nice world, it would just kind of work and insert a load of junk into the table. But in this case, if I pop that out, the second very serious problem is that I'm exposing sensitive information. So we find this in A10 in terms of logging. We also find it in terms, I think it's A5 sensitive data exposure. Not only has this shown me the call stack, as it happens, I can see, literally see the text that's being run as my SQL query. So if I'm an attacker, this is gold dust. So this is the only information I now need to see. Right, I've got a, a table name. So I know there's a table called bank account, and that's fantastic. So with that, I also know there is a column called name in bank account. So I've already been given information by doing almost nothing, by, by you know, giving no effort to the situation, I've managed to find out information about the system. And to an attacker, that's all they need to then start digging deeper and deeper and deeper. So what happens now, let's just go back, go back again. Oh, come on, load the page again. What happens if instead of doing what I did there, what happens if I do something like specific like delete from bank account because you see it's given me the table name so I because I now know the table name that is valid SQL so what's going to happen now if I run this do you think well it seems a bit strange because it's told me the accounts created why is the account been created well before we look at what's happened in the table delete from bank account if you know anything about SQL, you'll know, well, what it's just done is it's run that, which is a valid insert statement. And then immediately it's run delete from bank account and everything else is commented out. So to prove that's broken everything, if you look there, that is a, a severe integrity violation that an attacker could go in and delete a load of existing accounts out of a database table as I say, by doing very, very little, all they've done is typed in a bit of text. The systems told them some information and they've now um, kind of been screwed. So the kind of underlying issue here is that if we look in the controller, we're effectively doing, we've seen this in the error message already, it's doing a basic string substitution it's saying well the the data's come in from our model from the page and i'm literally just copying and pasting it to all intents and purposes into this string dot format and then i'm running the query now there's no way at the minute that the system is going to know whether that's valid there's no way the compiler is going to know if it's valid there's nothing about this code that's going to give us any help to know um that you know that what we've done is wrong so that's um, kind of the, the, the first example of how we could do something bad, like kind of, you know, deleting things. But I mean, if I go back to the application again, I mean, the uh, other than integrity violation by deleting data, what would happen if I kind of did select star from bank account? Now, as it happens, because I'm actually running a non query, I'm not going to get any information back onto this page, but on some websites, that's exactly what would happen if I ran this code, assuming there was anything in bank account because I have just deleted all, all of the rows. But if there was something in there, the attacker could end up with a, you know, a whole massive page of bank account information. And that could be passwords, that could be usernames, addresses, it could be anything. I mean, this is literally what an attacker would do. They can do it very anonymously. They can do it from halfway around the world and they can get all of the information they need by doing that. But what else can we do? Well, as well as deleting information, as well as getting information back, I can also do some kind of traversal because now I know that the site is vulnerable and I've got one table called bank account, which I know exists. 
what happens if I do say select star from user? Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put it in square brackets, and that's because I want SQL to know that I'm attempting to reference a table. If I take out the brackets and that table doesn't exist, I get a slightly strange error message. What happens if I do this? Well, again, because I've got my errors turned on, it's going to tell me something very specific, invalid object name user. Great. I've just worked out that there is not a table called user. But what happens if I then try, well, what about users? Is a table called users. Now, because that has said account created, that means that that data is valid. In other words, this has just told me that there is a table called users. So even though on this page I can't get any information out of that users table, because in this case I'm not selecting any data, I'm not printing any data to the screen, on another site that might be all that it takes to, to show you the data from the users, or you might be able to use the fact that that table exists to then go back and either delete data from users or find another page <coughs> where I can either inject something into users, update a column, you know, do, do whatever I want to do as an attacker. And if all I'm doing here is doing it in lots of little steps. There are again tools that exist that will automate this for you as well. So this is you know really, really serious stuff. So let's go back to here and kind of say, well, you know, how do we fix it? This is, you know, kind of important. Well, the first point to make is fix it is very easy when you're building a new site. You know, you just do it properly. And just doing it properly means have a secure software development lifecycle. You should have a software development lifecycle anyway. And that's checklists, that's processes, that's authorizing things, that's signing off things, that's saying the architecture gets signed off by the manager and by the architect or whatever. You know, we've got a code review checklist, which everyone has to use when they're reviewing code to make sure we're not doing things badly. So have a secure development lifecycle, have code review checklists, build all of this stuff in. So these controls that we're going to talk about in a second, build them all in. If it's a new site, really, it's not hard. Fix fixing an existing site, of course, might be much harder. You might have less access to the code. You might have a much lower appetite for changes because of things getting broken in the in the past. So you've got to work out how to do that. But I would suggest that doing nothing is not really an option. If you find an existing site is vulnerable, you're going to need to do something at some level. So we've got kind of two database level ways in which we can fix this. And we're just going to have a quick look at those if we go back to the code here. So at the moment, we've done it in the form of text and we've just used a basic string substitution. But what happens if instead of doing it that way, we go for something called a parameterized query? So the parameterized query is a very, very simple, a very similar and very simple mechanism. So rather than using a string format to put the value of our text into the SQL, we use this syntax call, you know, which often uses the at to mark the parameter. But in other languages, in other frameworks, it might look slightly different. The basic idea is the same and exists across all frameworks as far as I know. Effectively, we put in a placeholder. So we're saying the command basically uses a parameter called name. But now I have a way of adding a parameter called name that has the value taken from my page. And otherwise, I run it in exactly the same way. So let's build that again. And let's go back to our application and we'll reload it. And this time we're going to do exactly the same atta attempted attack as we did before, like something like that. And we're going to call create account. Now, this time it still looks like it succeeded, but that's what happened before. But significantly, if we go back and refresh this, we will see as well as the three accounts we just created when we were playing around. You see, it's added an account with all of that information as the name. Now, why has that happened? It's happened because in this code here, when we've put in this substitution for the parameter, it's going to take all of the text that we put in. It's going to quote it and it's going to escape anything that looks like SQL. So effectively, all of the text that we saw here becomes a quoted name. 
and that's why it appears in here again that's not perfect it's not ideal but it has got around the initial problem of injecting data uh, in straight into the SQL query rather than into the value itself now the next way we can do it we can do it in a fairly similar way by using something called a store procedure so if instead of using type text we now set this to be st type stored proc and we do that here by setting the command type i've created a store procedure in here and the bank account and I haven't actually tested this, but I'm hoping it's going to work. There is a store procedure called proc create account. And we do a very similar thing in terms of parameter binding as to what we just did. So we create a parameter called at name and we bind to it the text that we get from the page and we execute it as a non query again. I'm not actually sure if um, no, that is correct. Fine. Let's give this a go. Firstly, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to try and delete all of these rows. Yep, just to make sure. Yep, just so we can see what's going on. So we've now rebuilt this. We're going to go back. We're going to reload our page again. Now, this functionally should have exactly the same functionality as the parameterized query. So let's just do something like that. Do create account. Uh, prop create account okay that's what happens when you don't test stuff okay i'm not going to bother for now trying to find out um what oh is it yeah i don't know we could okay, give this a quick go see if that works uh if we go back to this could not find store procedure da -da 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 -da. um and if that doesn't work, I'm just going to ignore it for now. OK, let's ignore that for now. I should have tested it, but I didn't. The advantage that this has over the parameterized query is a slightly more subtle but very, very useful security feature is that certainly in SQL Server and in some other database engines, historically, MySQL couldn't do it, but that might be different now. I haven't checked. But in SQL Server, what you can do is you can say, well, this connection string that I have in here, which is to local DB, well, I can actually lock down the permissions that this user has. And I can say this user is not allowed to delete, drop, select, update, or insert into any table. I can restrict it and say it is only allowed to call store procedures. The nice thing about that, I mean, I could restrict it even more if I have a specific schema. I could have, you know, my web app schema and I can say it can only call store procedures within the web app schema. And the reason that's important is because then if I don't have a store procedure that does anything bad, then an attacker cannot do anything bad. Even if they break the app, even if they find the connection string and the username and the password, if they try and call drop table blah, it's going to fail because they don't have drop table permissions. Even if they try to select star from users, not going to work. Don't have select permission. So they can only do what the store procedures let them do. So that's why this is a preferred method to the parameterized query. Why not use it all the time? Well, it takes that much more effort to use store procedures. They're all going to have to be written individually. And in some cases, when you're using things like Active Record or Entity Framework, it's simply not possible to use store procedures to do some of that work. So you would have to make a big design decision. It's more secure. It's arguably slightly harder to do it. So that's a kind of a decision that you'll need to take. The other thing, of course, that's really important here is not to expose error messages. So if I uncomment these bits and if I try and get that to line up properly again, then what we're saying here is if there is an exception, which we don't expect, but if there is, then we would log some kind of error here. We should be using a logging framework. I haven't shown that. And then we could just show a nice simple error message to the user instead. So now if we go back to this, if we keep it using the same code, then we, we would hope that we wouldn't see that exception anymore. What we'll see is an error occurred. And then our logging and our monitoring should have picked this up somehow and said, oh, hang on a sec, something bad's happened because 
that that should never happen so that's how we use the parameterized queries and the store procedures the next security control input validation is so important input validation catches so many problems really easy to do it and all it involves is going back to our data model and saying well okay i've added some attributes this is dotnet core it's obviously going to be different in your framework but the basic idea is somehow we add a either a regular expression if it's a simpler piece of data we could add a string or a number validator to say well it's just a number so if they type anything else then you can fail in this case i've added a fairly simple regex just to show the concept this isn't uh, a recommended regex because it's very restrictive it expects two names separated by a space so if i build this and then i go back and load that again if i then try one of those attack ones again like that you can see that automatically i get this you know this error the field bank account name must match a regular expression i can put a nicer message than that but for the this example that doesn't really matter the point is it's caught the error now why is this not perfect and why shouldn't we rely on input validation alone well if i do that that's that's going to well, oh, sorry, it's not going to work because I'm still using a store procedure. Let's go back and put one that works in like this. And let's build that again. We talk about testing everything, but hey. So if I reload that again. And I do that one. It's going to create the account. So again, visibly, that's obviously not correct. But it's designed to allow things like, you know, Mark O'Connor. So that obviously is a valid name with the apostrophe. But because the regex is not perfect, if I go to here, we'll see it's actually created that there. What do we do with that? Well, that's kind of a slightly different question. That's about how to balance a regular expression for completeness with usability if you're too strict and somebody comes along and says oh his name's o'connor with a dash or you know smith connor or whatever the name might be and then all of a sudden it doesn't work and you go oh no it doesn't work so you obviously want valid names to go through but you don't want people to be doing stuff like that which might actually be a sql injection attack because unfortunately a dash is a comment in sql as much as it's a double barreled name joiner so you'll have to kind of consider that you could make your regex more complicated you could say i will allow you one dash and one dash only uh, i could say i will specifically not allow a double dash you could do a number of things like that but that's that's kind of up to you the point being that that input validator took all of one line of code and you got all of that extra protection as easy as that don't forget the required attribute. It's also important. Blank can also be an, an attack injector. If you're expecting some text and you haven't planned for a blank string, then you can also end up in trouble with your error messages. So that's probably the long and short of it. Don't rely on input validation alone because it's rarely perfect. You often have to have your validation regular expressions to be kinder than you would like them to be just to try and avoid people getting blocked from using the system but input validation is a nice very easy to use very good security control generally but parameterized queries and store procedures are going to help you at the database level so final slide here please read the top 10 publication owasp.org that's actually the pdf itself but if you google or search for owasp top 10 you'll find the page you'll find the pdf you might find it in your own language if you need to but otherwise comments and suggestions please below the video and otherwise i'll be releasing my next video as soon as i've managed to put it together so enjoy it um, please use this for training if you like there's no charge to do that i would obviously appreciate my name being mentioned because i've put it together but otherwise yeah please feel free to use this in security training and any comments or suggestions add them below thank you very much